Tracking the protests in the States now, police in Oregon have used tear gas and flash grenades to disperse crowds in Portland where protests against President-elect Donald Trump continued on Friday night. There at least one person was injured in a shooting uh, in the demonstrations in Portland too. Oh, it's being shot in the air. The gun's being shot in the air. The gun's being shot. Someone got shot. Someone got shot. There was a scene on a bridge. Police used pepper spray on the crowds and made several arrests. Officers urged protesters to leave the area immediately. The rallies descended into violence in the city on Thursday night when protesters smashed cars and shop fronts. The police said dangerous and criminal behaviour led them to redefine the gatherings as riots. There's been protests uh, in other places as well, Dozen, dozens of other cities. In fact, that's a scene in New York. It's all centering around the uh, Trump building for the last couple of days. Most of those protests have been peaceful, but there have been some arrests. Let's switch now to Florida, Miami. People halted traffic on two major highways Friday night. Well, uh, elsewhere in Washington, a tunnel was blocked. People uh, chanting anti-Trump slogans there too. Portland has seen a third night of protests following the election of Donald Trump as the 45th US president. There are reports that a man was shot in the leg on Morrison Bridge as demonstrators marched against the president-elect. The unrest was described as a riot by police on Thursday, citing extensive criminal and dangerous behavior. In Miami, hundreds of Not My President protesters took to the streets carrying signs and flags claiming the Trump victory will hurt women, the LGBT community and immigrants. In New York City, artist Matthew Chavez covered the walls of the city's subway with post-its to allow New Yorkers to express their thoughts on the election results. Those using the subway mused on the ballot's outcome. I feel a little sad and uh, scared what's going to happen in our country. I'm pretty, pretty upset, pretty down. I mean, I think a lot of New Yorkers are. You know, it's very shocking to say the least. Um, you know, but we realize that we don't live in a bubble. And, uh, you know, we got to get on board somehow. More marches have been planned to counter the Trump presidency and the Republican majority in both houses. Rallies have been organized for later today in New York and LA, and a protest is planned for Washington on January the 20th, when the New York businessman succeeds President Barack Obama. With Donald Trump set to be the next president, California may try to go it alone. Cal exit, Califrexit, no matter what you call it. Many across California want the state to secede from the union. But this reaction to election results isn't really new. In fact, last election, the Obama administration received secession petitions from all 50 states. Six states even got enough signatures to merit responses from the White House. Texas's petition received over 100,000 signatures. But one reason these states didn't secede, and why California's chances probably aren't that great either, is leaving the union isn't just a state's decision to make. If California voted to leave through a ballot measure, it'd still have to go through one of two difficult processes. Either the federal constitution would have to be amended, which would require two-thirds of the House and Senate's approval, and just over three-quarters of the states. California could also call a state's convention, with at least 38 state legislatures and two-thirds of delegates giving the okay to secede. Внимательно следили за этой кампанией. We have been following this campaign with attention. Хочу поздравить американский народ с завершением избирательного цикла. And I'd like to congratulate the American people with the end of the electoral cycle. А господина Дональда Трампа с победой на этих выборах. And I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Donald Trump with his victory in these elections. Но Россия 
готова и хочет восстановления полноформатных отношений с Соединенными Штатами. Повторяю, исходим из того, что это будет непростой путь, но мы готовы пройти и свою часть. I repeat, we understand that this will be a difficult way, but we are ready to play our part in it. Sources report Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his allies hope to benefit from Donald Trump's election win. It is stated they believe it has saved them from the risks of an interventionist Clinton administration. Trump's election may have already shifted the course of the Russian-backed military campaign in Aleppo, as officials told reporters plans to capture the East were shaped around an assumption Clinton would win in January. We share a purpose, our two countries, where we want to build places where the middle class and those working hard to join it have a chance. We need governments focused on service, and that's what we're going to keep doing. We're going to keep working uh, with people right around the world. We're going to work with our neighbors, and I'm going to work with President-elect Trump's administration uh, as we move forward in a positive way for not just Canadians and Americans, but the whole world. Ngayon, dito tayo. Ayaw ko nga sabi ko magkipag-away kasi nandiyan na si Trump. But uh, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, President uh, Trump. Mabuhay ka! Ich gratuliere dem Gewinner der Präsidentschaftswahl in den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika, Donald Trump, zu seinem Wahlsieg. Die Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika sind eine alte und ehrwürdige Demokratie. Der Wahlkampf in diesem Jahr war ein besonderer, mit zum Teil schwer erträglicher Konfrontation. Ich habe also, wie wohl die allermeisten von Ihnen, dem Wahlausgang mit besonderer Spannung entgegengesehen. Wen das amerikanische Volk in freien und fairen Wahlen zu seinem Präsidenten wählt, das hat Bedeutung weit über die USA hinaus. Für uns Deutsche gilt, mit keinem Land außerhalb der Europäischen Union haben wir eine tiefere Verbindung als mit den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika. It's the third weekend of protests against South Korean President Park Geun-hye, but this one was massive. 260,000 people by police estimates, hundreds of thousands more according to organizers, as Park, whose approval rating is just 5%, faces mounting pressure to step down. They're angry over allegations the 64-year-old has allowed a close confidant she's known since the 1970s to meddle in state affairs. Choi soon sil is considered by some here the most powerful person in South Korea. She's long suspected of exerting control over Park's policy direction and the hiring of senior government officials, but Park's apology last month that she had indeed sought advice from Choi only fueled public anger. Saturday's march was peaceful, in contrast to previous demonstrations dominated by militant unions and civic groups that clashed with police. This time, protesters included students, families, and couples pushing baby strollers. The main opposition says the rally suggests growing support in parliament to remove Park from power, but there's been no formal move yet to launch impeachment proceedings. The protesters clashed with police during a demonstration against Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in the German city of Cologne. Several thousand people, including pro-Kurdish demonstrators, attended the rally. The protest was held against Turkey's crackdown on dissent following a failed coup attempt against Erdogan in July. 
Protesters uh, called for the German government and Europe to take political action against Ankara over the crackdown. They also demanded the German government put pressure on Turkey and make Erdogan reverse his, quote, anti-democratic policies. And several protesters are arrested following clashes with police in Cologne. Sunday marks the one-year anniversary of the Paris terrorist attacks that killed 130 people. And while all of France is honoring the victims of the attack, there was some unexpected news. France's year-long state of emergency could be extended again. French Prime Minister Manuel Valls told the BBC, It is difficult at this stage to end the state of emergency, especially as we are about to begin a presidential election campaign in a few weeks when public meetings will be held. We need to protect our democracy. The state of emergency was declared the same night as the attacks and was extended first in February and again in July. It originally was only supposed to last two weeks. The state of emergency allows French security forces to perform warrantless searches, and it has been used not only against terrorist cells, but also to break up protests. Protesters have called the state of emergency a government coup, and Muslim and human rights groups say it's discriminatory against France's Muslim population. But a poll from the French Institute for Public Opinion in June found the majority of people either liked the state of emergency as it is now, or wanted it to be even stronger. Listen to this. Terrorists who attacked Paris in November of last year, remember that? We have a terrorist, Salah Abdeslam. He was connected to that attack. And he's just admitting to authorities in Europe that he, yes, he did help at least 10 Islamic State fighters, ISIS fighters, enter into Belgium as, quote, refugees through the Balkan Channel. All 10 coordinated attacks that hit both Paris and later Brussels, leaving 215 people dead and wounding hundreds more. Scores of migrants set out on the long walk from Belgrade to the border with Croatia. They're demanding the EU open its doors to them. Thousands have been trapped in Serbia for months after the Balkan country's EU neighbours beefed up border controls to keep migrants away. There is a big problem for us in the Serbia and for refugees and we want to go to Croatia border and we, 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 it will be a very humble request of us for to open the border of Croatia and uh, we will go by walk uh, there from Belgrade city to uh, Croatia border. Hundreds of men have been camping out in parks or abandoned warehouses in Belgrade. Their plight has recently worsened. Human rights groups have been told to stop food deliveries outside migrant centers in a bid to move them off the streets. Now, new in a number of terror attacks planned for major Russian cities have been averted, apparently, after a security service counter-terror operation. Our correspondent Roman Kostrov's across this. Hi, Roman. Talk us through uh, what's been happening here. Well, we do know that uh, this Saturday, a Russian Federal Security Service uh, conducted an operation in Moscow and St. Petersburg and arrested uh, 10 uh, people suspected of uh, terrorism. An agency report said that uh, the suspects planned a series of uh, gun and uh, bomb attacks in two of the largest uh, cities in Russia, in Moscow and in uh, St. Petersburg. And they were to focus on uh, uh, public places with uh, large gatherings of uh, people. Now, uh, the FSB said that uh, the suspects had a total Total of uh, four very powerful improvised explosive devices as well as uh, automatic uh, weapons. Uh, uh, additionally, they also said that uh, uh, during the questioning, uh, the uh, suspects uh, identified uh, their uh, targets and they also talked about uh, their accomplices and support base, both here uh, in Russia and in different and other countries as well. It appears that the Syrian army was able to seize the western district of Aleppo from the rebel forces. On Saturday, Syrian forces were able to take back Dayyad al-Assad, the western district of Aleppo. The northern city has been split between government and the rebels for decades. The army's advances into the city were recently confirmed by the Fostikim rebel group's political office head, Zakaria Malahifshi. Malahifshi said, of course, when the regime takes control, it has a negative effect, but there is persistence. However, when it comes to the factions, Malahifshi said hopefully there will be change in the coming days. The executive body of the Global Chemical Weapons Watchdog voted to condemn the use of banned toxic agents by the Syrian government and ISIS. 
A source said around two-thirds of the 41 members on the Executive Council of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons endorsed the U.S. tabled text. The text was supported by 28 members, including Germany, France, Britain, and the U.S. It was opposed by Russia, Iran, and China. Russia and Iran are Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's main allies against rebels trying to overthrow him. Western and Gulf Arab states support the rebels. Syrian authorities deny using chemical weapons in the civil war. The Islamic State has not commented on their use of sulfur mustard gas. Russia's aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, is reportedly preparing for an attack against terrorist targets in the Aleppo province in Syria. RT's Murat Gazdiev is in the city for us. The Russian naval battle group, stationed now just off the coast of Syria and led by the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov, will begin hitting Islamist targets in the countryside of Aleppo in the coming days, according to a military source. Uh, they will be targeting not the city itself, but the countryside west of Aleppo, from where Islamists have now staged two unsuccessful attempts to break into the city, from where they have been shelling the city relentlessly and have left hundreds of civilian casualties over the last, uh, over the last month. We're also told that they won't be using just airstrikes, jets, but also the caliber cruise missiles, Russian cruise missiles that have been previously used in Syria to target ISIS and other jihadist groups. There's no specific time frame. We've been told that this will happen in the coming days. Several countries in Europe have reported outbreaks of the highly contagious bird flu strain H5N8. In Austria, the health ministry ordered that all birds on a poultry farm be destroyed this week after a turkey tested positive for the virus. Though it has never been found in humans, H5N8 is particularly virulent in wild birds. The Austrian farmer affected by the call spoke of the impact on his business. Christmas is when we see our main turnover, he said. We have to kill about a thousand animals. For us, this is a huge challenge to deal with both physically and mentally. We will have to see how we can cope with the situation economically. Along with Austria, cases in Germany, Switzerland, Hungary and Croatia have all recently been reported. 9,000 turkeys were destroyed in the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein this week, while the Dutch government has ordered all poultry flocks be kept indoors. A powerful earthquake has struck New Zealand's South Island. The epicentre was reported to have been around 90 kilometres north of Christchurch. A tsunami warning has been issued, calling on people on the east coast to move inland and find higher ground. The 7.4 magnitude tremor, which struck just after midnight local time, was felt across a large area. Power was knocked out in some areas and people rushed out into the streets, but there were no immediate reports of casualties. Christchurch was devastated by an earthquake in 2011 that left 185 people dead and damaged the city centre. Nati Sanchez, a Spanish resident in Christchurch, witnessed the latest quake and told Euronews, The truth is that here you learn to live with the earth trembling from time to time but it's true that this time it's been huge. We were asleep, it was midnight, and of course you wake up because you start to notice that obviously everything's moving furiously. The doors begin to open and close, the mirrors begin to shake with the walls. Good evening. Riverland fruit growers have told how they'll be forced to lay off staff following the devastating hailstorm which has caused up to $100 million damage. The government says it will provide financial support to those affected as farmers try to resurrect their businesses. More than a million dollars of fruit now destined for the bin. 100% write-off, got nothing to salvage from it. Just Everything's just destroyed. 
exist for its nectarine and peach farm at Lirup in the Riverland, smashed by Friday's hailstorm, making the crop that was just weeks away from harvest now worthless. Yesterday afternoon I had to make the call to 15 people to say you have no, more, no job. 10 minutes of a storm and it just destroyed everything for us. The company was set to export its fruit to China for the first time this year. That plan now over. Which was a new market, which is quite exciting, which we've done a lot of hard work for to build a brand name into. The grower, just one of dozens in the region affected, vineyards also in the firing line, as well as farmers. The total damage bill expected to top $100 million. Iran's water supplies are under threat, its reserves depleted by waste and inefficiency, once fertile lands now drained and barren. Innovative solutions are at last being applied, but will they be enough? Welcome back to Wall Street Week. In the days following Donald Trump's victory, the market's reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. But our next guest seems to think that it won't last. Let's welcome back former budget director under President Ronald Reagan, David Stockman. David, yeah. when you joined us about a month ago, right. you sort of warned viewers to go to cash. You thought the markets would be very volatile. Obviously, we've had this, uh, this, this Trump bump. Right. But you're very concerned now, um, despite what Mario was just talking about, the sort of growth acceleration. Your main concern right now is what's going to happen in terms of the deficit. Yeah, we have to be uh, focused now on the morning after, not the giddiness of the two days after. Two things have happened this week that are just uh, shocking, like political, uh, economic, and uh, uh, financial earth you know, has gone out of its uh, orbit, I think. Now, one was the asteroid that hit Tuesday night. I mean, that hit Washington, D.C., the ruling establishment, like nothing we've ever had, at it, least in 100 years. You? Why, if the growth that is forecast now happens and, and we start to actually pay off the deficit after we grow it, what's wrong with that? Because uh, <laughs> there is $20 trillion ticking time bomb called the debt ceiling right in front of us. Uh, that will happen in March. Uh, the new Trump administration is going to inherit that mess. I call it a stink bomb left uh, from last October when they made that deal, Boehner and uh, Obama, right. uh, for the new president, and it's going to consume the entire first 100 days trying to get that thing through. The Republicans are not going to want to vote for a $20 trillion debt ceiling. He's going to have to go to Democrats. When you go to Democrats, they say no, no on Obamacare. No on some of the big regulations that you want to lift. No on a big tax cut for the wealthy. Uh, we'll argue with you on the tax cut for corporations and how we're going to do it. So my point is the market was giddy on the view that uh, Washington is coming to the rescue with a huge new fiscal stimulus and infrastructure and all that. That is dead wrong. The news flash is that Washington is out of business. The imperial city is in smoking ruins. It will not function. It will be acrimony, confrontation, brinksmanship. So if you were advising And well, if I could just finish, so one, one point, that means we'll hit the next recession with nothing to break the fall. Are you serious? Are you serious? I'm here in Tiberias, in Israel, in Tiberias, and I'm getting ready to go to a meeting we're getting ready to have here, but we just got information. Andy Firecharger, some of you may remember him on YouTube. You may. I'm going to put his link below in a few minutes, but we just got word the Sanhedrin has just put a request out to Russia's President Vladimir Putin and to America's president-elect Donald Trump to please come and help them build the third temple in Jerusalem. Are you serious? Something biblical is going on with the signs of the second coming of Christ. We are truly living in prophetic times like we've never seen before.